I hope that none of you will feel that this panel is a bit of a letdown because not one of the three panelists, not one, has been the Grand Chief of the Aboriginal First Nations or Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> but they're still young, <laughs> so you never know. And they are all extremely well informed about what's the background here. This is a foundational session we're about to have. There have been references to this treaty or that treaty and where did we get from and this is going to be your background session explaining how we got to where we are. Now our three speakers I will introduce individually as they come up and the way it's going to work is they'll come up here deliver their 15 to 20 minute talk and then we will break briefly and then we'll get into the usual question and answer session with the usual very brief questions and before but before we do that we'll have a an in-house discussion where wired up for sound the three panelists will discuss issues that have come up in the course of the first part and then we'll get to on to the straight uh, introductory step in last night's stirring speech, Roberta Jameson mentioned that this is the 250th anniversary of 1763, the Treaty of Paris that put an end to the Seven Years' War. And for Canadians, the key point was that it established the recent unpleasantness on the Plains of Abraham as a definite win for Britain, point one, and point two, it established direct diplomatic contact between the Crown of Britain and the First Nations of Canada. So since 1763, there has been this contractual relationship. And our three speakers are all very knowledgeable about that, and they're going to take us through it. First, we're going to have Chris Alcantara, who is the author of two books, one of them co-authored with Tom Flanagan, and his education took him from McMaster to Calgary and to his PhD at the University of Toronto. He's an associate professor currently in the Department of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University. Chris. All right, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, I think it's safe to say uh, that one of the most uh, important political problems facing Canada today is the Crown's relationship with Indigenous peoples. And Canada's history is filled with uh, Indigenous protests, uh, such as the recent Idle No More movement, uh, conflict, such as what's going on at what's what happened at Oka, Ipawash, and Caledonia, and economic disruption. And all of these uh, events are, in my view, expressions of frustration towards the inability of Canada to create an equitable and harmonious relationship with Indigenous peoples in this country. But this relationship hasn't always been so negative and contentious, and it doesn't have to be that way uh, in the future. So what I want to do today is give you a brief overview of the Aboriginal Crown relationship as it, as, uh, it has evolved over the years, covering some of the ground that, that uh, Ms. Jameson covered. And then I'll talk about what I think needs to be done to repair and renew this relationship. So how do we get uh, to where we are today? How do we get to this relationship between the Crown and Aboriginal peoples that's very much a top-down, highly colonial, in a lot of ways disrespectful and uh, contentious? And to answer this question, I think we need to go back to the beginning when Europeans first settled in North America. Uh, and when Europeans first arrived to this new world, uh, they encountered a dizzying array of Aboriginal nations, complete with vast uh, and highly complex uh, trading economies and advanced political systems. And these nations were surviving and thriving in the harsh climate of North America. And so outnumbered and unprepared to survive this harsh climate, European settlers frequently turned to indigenous communities for support. And so to formalize these initial relationships, uh, many European settlers uh, sometimes engaged in nation-to-nation -nation treaties with uh, indigenous communities, establishing friendship alliances, military alliances, and economic alliances to facilitate trade. And 
Now, over time, these initial nation-to-nation -nation relationships began to shift in nature as settler populations grew in the New World, in the New World, and demands for land, specifically indigenous lands, increased. And so at first, the British government was concerned about this and tried to stave off settler demand. And so in 1763, uh, it, it announced the Royal Proclamation, which basically said that, among other things, that indigenous lands could only be acquired through the crown. And so settlers could not purchase indigenous lands directly from indigenous peoples. And so this was, this was an attempt to protect indigenous lands from, from squatters, from European squatters and settlers. But settler demand proved too difficult and too powerful for the British government to ignore. And so it began to engage in a series of land acquisition treaties. These were treaties no longer about friendship and military, uh, but instead they were about acquiring indigenous lands uh, in exchange for money, goods, smaller lands, sometimes health and education benefits, among other things. And so this original nation-to-nation uh, -nation relationship was being transformed into a purely economic and many, in some cases uh, an exploitive one based on land acquisition. And at the same time that these uh, land acquisition treaties were occurring, uh, indigenous populations were on a dramatic decline uh, due to their many years as, as uh, powerful and, and helpful allies in European wars in the New World, in the New World, and exposure to European diseases, these wreaked havoc on indigenous uh, populations. And so the British government uh, surveyed this situation and believed that the only solution was to civilize, which meant educate and Christianize, uh, and eventually assimilate indigenous peoples. And so you have a number of things happen in this period. For instance, the creation of the first Indian reserves in 1820s, before Canada uh, was founded. And then in 1867, uh, Canada is born. And the federal government takes sole responsibility over indigenous peoples under the BNA Act of 1867, our original constitution. And initially, Canada's approach to indigenous communities was piecemeal until 1876 when it passed the Indian Act. And I'm surprised we got this far without talking about the Indian Act. So I'm going to try and rectify that. And the Indian Act is important because it, it brought together this piecemeal approach into, into a coherent plan that redefined and attempted to redefine almost every aspect of life on, in, on indigenous communities in the South governing things like property rights, uh, government, and band membership, among other things. And the basic goal of this act was it was a transitionary act that was to help indigenous communities, to help indigenous communities transition towards full assimilation. That was the goal, as Roberta Jameson mentioned, uh, quoting some of the, the main policymakers. And so through the Indian Act, you get all sorts of really crappy things. Uh, you know, you get highly, you get really crappy property rights, West, quasi-Western, highly deficient property rights. You get, uh, uh, communities are forced to adopt elected band councils, ignoring the fact that many communities had very highly functioning traditional governance structures, which divided communities. You have the Indian Act imposing band membership rules on communities, again, ignoring the fact that, you know, these bands have had gen you know, years and years of, of their own ways of, de of defining their uh, membership. And you have uh, a number of important provisions that ban cultural practices like the potlash out west, and also uh, 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 provisions that uh, banned raising money for political organizing. So you couldn't even uh, organize, uh, use, uh, raise money for political organizing. And so in short, the Indian Act was a, uh, attempted to impose a dramatic set of changes on indigenous communi communities, and the results were predictable whenever you do this type of stuff you create all sorts of, for when it's imposed from above, you could create all sorts of political and societal divisions, economic and social marginalization, poverty and conflict. Now things start to change in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, Aboriginal peoples, as again I think uh, Ms. Jameson mentioned, had come back after having served as valuable members of the Canadian military in, in World War II. This was also a time when Canadians and also you know, the rest of the world was beginning to recognize the importance of universal human rights. And so Canada's treatment of its indigenous peoples did not fit very well with this new human rights consciousness. And finally, during this period, indigenous peoples at this time began a new wave of organizing and mobilizing, creating a, creating a variety of organizations uh, that sought to influence Canadian uh, politics. And then, as, as mentioned before, in 1969, the federal government is concerned about all of these trends and it attempts under the leadership of uh, Pierre Trudeau and his, his minister Jean Chrétien, they tried to introduce the white paper which basically sought to impose in their view equality on all Aboriginal peoples by eliminating their status and transferring all remaining jurisdiction over these uh, communities to the provinces. 
So that's what the white paper was going to do. And indigenous communities uh, successfully mobilized to defeat the white paper, and this forced the federal government to have a, a powerful rethink about how it should approach uh, indigenous peoples uh, in Canada. And so initial efforts, we have a, a new era of what I would call federal confusion about what to do with indigenous peoples. Uh, and so you see the initial efforts focused first on constitutional reform. And this led to the inclusion of a number of provisions in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protecting things like Aboriginal uh, uh, right, uh, treaty rights and title. You have the inclusion of Aboriginal representatives at first minister's conferences when such meetings focused exclusively on Aboriginal issues. And the federal government also began to negotiate uh, modern treaties with those groups that had never signed uh, treaties in the past. And so there were another, another number of other initiatives as well that I can't cover today. But the overall, the results of all these, um, these uh, strategies was mixed. Uh, some things had positive effects, a lot of them had negative effects. And I, I argue that the, the results were mixed because underlying all of these initiatives uh, was the same top-down top colonial mindset and relationship that has dominated uh, Canadian, Canadian uh, policy since the British and up and through today through the Indian Act. And indeed, throughout this period, despite all these changes that were going on at the constitutional level, at executive federalism levels, all these different levels, the Indian Act remained the same. And I think that's telling, that the Indian Act, despite all of these constitutional reforms, these uh, modern treaties, the Indian Act remained basically unchanged. There was one major attempt uh, to reform the Indian Act in 2002, which was again, which, which had shades of, white, of the white paper because the federal government at that time tried to impose a variety of major changes on all the 600 Indian bands without their consent. And predictably, the indigenous community again resisted this initiative. And eventually the federal government uh, abandoned it. So despite all these efforts to change uh, uh, the overall nature of it, which is top down, it's colonial, it's this idea of imposing a one size fits all solution, uh, it remained fairly stable, and so we continue to face a number of important challenges uh, in Aboriginal communities. So it's clear to me from this history that uh, the, the Crown Indigenous relationship needs to change because the dominant approach is simply not working. And instead, in my view, the path forward must be to forge a relationship that respects and empowers Aboriginal communities to make free and independent choices about how they want to interact with Canadian society. This is. I think where I might depart from some people, which, which to me means uh, recognizing that some communities, some indigenous communities, will want to pursue greater linkages with the uh, Canadian economy, with the Canadian political system, but also recognizing that some indigenous communities are going to want to pursue a more separate relationship from a separate but cooperative relationship. Right? The indigenous communities are diverse. They have diff uh, a diverse set of interests and diverse set of goals, and they're going to have a, want a diverse set of relationships with the Crown. And so the Crown's job, I think, is to recognize that a one-size-fits-all solution is neither possible nor preferable. Instead, the role of the Crown should be to help indigenous communities choose freely their own path whether and relationship with Canada, whether that is stronger linkages with our economy and our political system, or whether it's a more of a separate type of relationship. So how do we achieve this, this uh, new indigenous Crown relationship? And I think that many commentators who call for radical and sudden change uh, fail to appreciate how difficult it really is to engage in policy and institutional changes in liberal democratic uh, systems. All we have to do is look at Canada's experiences with constitutional reform to see just how difficult it is to accomplish radical and sudden change. So instead, I, in my view, change has to occur slowly and incrementally at a variety of levels using a variety of mechanisms. I'm going to talk about three uh, to illustrate this argument. So let me begin with the Indian Act. Everyone agrees, I don't, I don't know anyone who disagrees with this argument, but everyone agrees that the Indian Act needs to be scrapped or changed, and yet the legislation remains in effect. So why is that? Well, for one, nobody can agree with what should replace the Indian Act. Okay? So indigenous communities are extremely diverse. Uh, they have very different economies, different, uh, very different cultures, legal traditions, uh, interests. And so it's proven impossible to come up with a piece of legislation, a new legislation, that would sufficiently take into account that diversity. As well, some communities are simply unprepared to leave the Indian Act for a variety of reasons. I mean, uh, one example is the Labrador Innu, who uh, recently, in the last 10 years, uh, uh, applied and have successfully become an Indian Act band. And so the Indian Act remains in place basically uh, unchanged. 
So how do we move uh, beyond the Indian Act uh, to start crafting a more effective and respectful relationship? One way is to empower and encourage indigenous communities to come up with alternative legislation for the various parts of the Indian Act, so changing the Indian Act one provision at a time. So to give you an example, in the early 1990s, a group of chiefs uh, from out west approached the federal government about opting out of the land management provisions of the Indian Act. They wanted to create their own land codes to govern their lands in their own traditional ways. The federal government agreed and worked with these chiefs to craft a framework agreement in 1996 and then federal legislation in 1999. So as a result today, we have 39 aboriginal communities that have opted into the new legislation and are currently working outside of the Indian Act on issues related to land management. And there's dozens more who are working towards that same goal. And, and this is a, a real success story in terms of coming from uh, indigenous communities and in terms of policy change. And this, this approach was successful because the idea for the legislation came from the indigenous communities themselves rather than from Ottawa. And it was an opt-in voluntary process rather than a top-down imposed, and imposed one. So you don't have the same type of criticisms about meaningful consultation in this type of a process compared to the, what usually occurs. And so ideally, the federal government should encourage uh, all First Nations to approach them with proposals for developing other legislative alternatives to land management or any other provisions uh, within the Indian Act. So for instance, uh, Manny Jules is currently working on legislation that would provide interested communities with title and jurisdiction over their reserved lands, and eventually the power to create fee simple uh, property rights. And so if this legislation passes, communities will now have another land management option from which to choose. You know, they can choose the, the First Nations Land Management Act, they can choose this new First Nations Property Ownership Act, or they can stay with the Indian Act. Or they can approach the federal government about another, developing another legislative alternative on land management or another issue. But in this way, indigenous communities themselves are slowly transforming the Indian Act into something that better serves their diverse interests and situations. And the end result is what every, everyone wants, which is the end of the Indian Act. Now, of course, reforming the Indian Act is only the first step, in my view, in changing the broader Crown Aboriginal relationship that exists in Canada. This relationship has to change at a variety of levels. At the federal, provincial, territorial level, as we've sort of talked about so far in, in, in some of the previous uh, uh, speeches, the Crown has long been criticized for failing to engage in meaningful consultation when crafting Aboriginal policy. So all we have to do is think about uh, the First Nations Governance Act, which I talked about in 2002, which tried to impose a set of changes on indigenous communities, and the Harper government's recent omnibus bills. That's two of many examples in which the federal government has failed to engage in meaningful consultation with indigenous communities. And for many government policymakers, uh, many, uh, meaningful consultation seems like an impossible threshold to beat. No matter what the federal government does, they, these policymakers uh, think, some indigenous leaders are going to constantly complain about the lack of meaningful consultation. In my view, this constant complaint is simply another reflection of the, negative, the broad negative relationship that the Crown has with some communities, with, with many indigenous communities in Canada. So what can, be done, what can be done at this level to get beyond this meaningful consultation problem? One solution is to be found in the wreckage of the Cologne Accord, which was, uh, as was mentioned, which is a $5.1 billion five-year agreement that was designed to bridge the life gap between Aboriginal Canadians and the rest of the population. And a little known fact about this agreement, too, was that, uh, the, that uh, Paul Martin was willing to, uh, was, was intending to negotiate a second five-year agreement. Should certain targets be met, they were going to do a second and commit a similar amount of money. So despite this accord being relegated uh, to the dustbin of history, unfortunately, by the Conservative government, uh, it still may hold important lessons for designing a new process that satisfies this need for meaningful consultation and a renewed relationship. So I don't have time to cover the, the, the details of the accord. You can uh, corner Paul Martin and he'll be happy, or, or Phil Fontaine, they'll be happy to talk to you about it. But the Accord offers a number of important lessons for us for how to renew the relationship between the Crown and Aboriginal communities. So even if you don't want to bring, re, re, resurrect the Colonial Accord, we can still use the lessons from that process to create a more just and, and equitable relationship that's going to work for both Canadians and non-Canadians. The first lesson that came from Kelowna was that effective and legitimate Aboriginal policy requires recognizing and empowering the relevant actors to do what they do best. Okay? So in, in the Kelowna Accord, for instance, when it came down to setting priorities about what should be addressed, 
Aboriginal groups were given that responsibility because they were the best positioned to figure out what were the issues uh, affecting their communities. And so they were given the lead to determine the, the range of issues to be addressed. In terms of implementing the accord, this responsibility fell again to the indigenous uh, organizations that were closest to the communities and the provincial governments because they had the necessary expertise in these policy areas. Education, infrastructure, and healthcare. This is not something that the federal government does very well. It's something that the provinces uh, have long had lots of more capacity in doing. And so the accord recognized that fact and, and transferred implementation responsibilities to the provinces and the Aboriginal organization. And so the federal government's role was basically doing what it does best, which is providing money. And for me, this division of labor, uh, which was the brainchild of Paul Martin, uh, was a recognition that the top-down approaches that had occurred in the past uh, were, uh, were a, a big reason why policy was so problematic in the past. And so he was adamant about ensuring that the federal government's role was limited to providing money. So that's the first lesson, is dividing, when it comes to adverse policy, recognizing what the different actors uh, do best and can bring to the table. A second lesson from the Cologne Accord is that a universal uh, approach to indigenous policy simply doesn't work. So a one-size-fits-all solution does not uh, uh, work. Instead, any approach has to be uh, asymmetrical in nature. And that means tailoring the processes and tools to account for the diversity that exists among indigenous communities. And so after uh, Kelowna was signed, the federal government signed individual agreements with each of the Aboriginal, the five major Aboriginal organizations, and was working with uh, each province to sign provincial agreements. Again, this was the idea of these individual agreements was to tailor, so you the overall uh, uh, Kelowna process, but then you had sub-agreements sub that would, would provide specific provisions to address uh, the particular problems that faced each of these individual communities because they represented different indigenous uh, situations. And so by recognizing these and other principles, the Accord uh, generated uh, the type of intergovernmental cooperation and support that has been rarely been seen in, in Canada in the area of indigenous policy. But changing the relationship at the federal, provincial, territorial levels is not enough. So it's not just enough to, to change the Indian Act. It's not enough just to change the relation, the, 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 what we call the, the intergovernmental relationship at the federal and the provincial level. We need to also understand uh, that changes at the local level are just as important. So a colleague and I have been working on a project that has found dozens of intergovernmental agreements across Canada that have been signed between Aboriginal governments and municipal regional governments. So the majority of these agreements are uh, jurisdictional agreements covering things like garbage, remo garbage removal or fire protection. A municipality will provide a First Nation community with fire protection in exchange for some sort of fee schedule. But a number of these agreements go beyond that. They are, uh, uh, some agreements are what we call relationship building agreements. These are ones in which the communities agree to communicate regularly on issues facing both the Aboriginal community and the local municipality. Other agreements focus on local policy coordination, so such as land zoning. You want to make sure that the reserve uh, 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 zones um, housing beside, not beside a garbage dump in the municipality. And so there's these agreements to ensure that the zoning matches up and works better. Uh, and we have also a number of agreements that what we call decolonization agreements because they contain language that recognize uh, things like Aboriginal self-government rights and title. These are municipalities that have signed agreements that recognize these types of things that uh, the upper level governments are much less interested in doing so. So these agreements, uh, which are becoming more frequent across the country, are another important source of Aboriginal Crown renewal. And so some Aboriginal and local communities are realizing that forging strong relationships is beneficial to both communities in terms of, of strengthening their economies, strengthening their political systems and social relations. And these new relationships are, are having an effect at, the, at other intergovernmental uh, arenas, like the federal and provincial level, you know, that, that municipalities and Aboriginal governments are working together uh, in other processes. And so this is, to me, this is a very, very much a good news story and something uh, that we can learn from. And so there are important lessons that I want to draw from these, uh, these relationships, these new relationships between municipalities and Aboriginal governments. One is that uh, the emergence of these agreements show that indigenous and non-indigenous communities can work together. They can forge positive, mutually beneficial, and cooperative relationships. So despite this notion that we're supposed to be completely different, in fact, uh, we share this, uh, many of the same goals and interests. And I think also important from these agreements is to give us a sense of where change is going to come from. Okay? And looking, at some of these, looking at some of these agreements, we found that there are a number of factors that generated these, co these, uh, these cooperative agreements. One factor that was important was the presence of dense, informal networks and connections between communities. 
So the extent to which local communities and Aboriginal communities interact, you know, so to what extent do they shop, do they attend each other's cultural events, to what extent these communities are linked, mattered. That the communities that had high levels of informal connections uh, tended to be the ones that had these type of agreements. And the second uh, factor that was important was the presence of political leadership, but also uh, community leaders who were willing to build relationships between the two communities. And so it's not just enough that we have political leaders like mayors or chiefs or prime ministers and grand chiefs. These are important actors in generating cooperation, but this is where, uh, where, where Can us Canadians as allies can have a real uh, difference, which is that uh, community leaders, whether it's business groups or church groups or cultural groups, your ability as leaders to foster relationships with your counterparts in the other community, we found that these type of relationships also had an extremely powerful predictor on to, to what extent um, municipalities are willing to cooperate. So these are two very practical lessons that come out of these agreements for what we as Canadians can do to help foster cooperation. So let me just end by saying, I think you know, the Aboriginal Crown relationship is clearly the most important challenge facing our country. Uh, you know, solving this, 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 improving this relationship will benefit both us and uh, Indigenous peoples. Uh, the goal should be a more just and equitable relationship, but also a relationship that recognizes the diversity that exists among Indigenous communities. And this is an important point, that Indigenous communities don't have one vision about what their relationship should be with Canada. Some want to pursue greater linkages with the Canadian economy, others don't. And, uh, and it's up to, up to the Crown and us to recognize that and to facilitate that. Thank you very much. Our third speaker is Sheila McLean. She is also at the University of Saskatchewan where she's an instructor and she's at work on her PhD. But even more important, she's one of the co-founders of Idle No More, which requires no explanation to this group. So, Sheila. Well, good morning. I'm so very honored to be invited to speak here at this important event, and I think it's vital that these conversations and actions that we talk about today continue long after we leave this beautiful place. I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit from what we've had so far. I want to begin by identifying myself as a third generation white settler from Treaty 6 territory. I'm a mother, I'm a teacher, I'm a PhD student in anti-racism, and I'm also one of the first organizers working in solidarity with Indigenous people in the Idle No More movement. I think in regards to the question of possibilities for transforming the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the Canadian people, it's important to ask ourselves, how are relations of inequality reproduced and maintained? As a white settler, sometimes it's my place to speak, like when the topic addresses the impact of settler colonialism on Indigenous peoples. However, the question I have been given on the Indian Act must be answered by the Indigenous peoples who are impacted by the laws as they are the experts on their own governance systems and experiences. In addition to the many problematic layers of oppression that exist within the Indian Act, the fact that it became legislation without the knowledge or consent of Indigenous nations reveals the consistency with which white settler identity is reproduced and maintained as a system of domination. Indigenous self-determination infers that any changes to the Indian Act must be decided by Indigenous nations. However, I would like to briefly address the question of possibilities moving forward. Two things remain clear to me, as Idle No More challenges daily the colonial practices that are being reproduced through laws, policies, and practices. First and foremost, there must be a redistribution of lands and resources back to Indigenous nations. And secondly, in order to dismantle inequality, we must actively intervene in the reproduction of white settler colonialism. Having researched the impact of settler colonialism for a number of years, 
it's clear that there are grand narratives which are recognizable to all of us, which are believed to be the truth, and which become common discourses of understanding to all settler Canadians. These narratives include the myth that nation building occurred on the foundations of democracy, freedom, tolerance, multiculturalism, and benevolence. These grand narratives construct white settlers as innocent of maintaining relations of domination, which masks the many layers of systemic oppression. In fact, these narratives are so powerful that settler Canadians actively deny any possible contradiction in our sense of our own history, and this reproduces not only our own superiority, but also our current policies and practices of domination. As my favorite author Thomas King states, the truth about stories is, that's all we are. The Idle No More movement is restoring Canada. It's challenging existing discourses of the Canadian national identity of innocence and articulating the true history of violent colonial nation building that has been actively minimized and silenced and denied for so long. The erasure of Indigenous peoples, histories, and territories from the Canadian landscape maintains white settler dominance by marking settlers, homesteaders, as the original inhabitants of the land. Idle No More, in alliance with Defenders of the Land, a network of Indigenous nations that came together in 2008 who had been defending their territories, challenged this by telling the truth about our history and current policies and practices in both national and international arenas. Now clearly, not all settlers are white, and there are multiple ways that people came to live on the Indigenous territories currently occupied by the Canadian state. While recognizing that there are settlers of color and mixed race settlers that benefit from indigenous lands, they also face systemic racism and oppression. And for this reason, my research is focused on the production of white settler colonialism because white settler identity maintains system of inequality. Settlers are socialized into a false logic that unlimited accumulation and consumption can be sustained on a planet with finite resources. What must be understood by those of us who benefit from settler colonialism is that the corporate wealth of the Canadian state is based on subsidies gained from the theft of indigenous lands and resources. Settler colonialism in Canada was designed to ensure forced displacement of indigenous peoples from their territories, the destruction of self-government, and the extinguishment of Indigenous rights for on long, ongoing land acquisition. Settler identity is performed when we stand by and accept the ongoing inequality and injustice that we see today. Active intervention in settler identity requires us to commit ourselves to replace the false logic of the colonial state and rebuild the conditions in which we want to live and the social relations which we want to cultivate. While the struggle for self-determination on this continent is 500 years old, more recently, Idle No More has inspired millions to action in defense of indigenous sovereignty, demanding social and political transformation and environmental sustainability. Idle No More organizers and activists maintain that indigenous self-determination must be the foundation of all our social and environmental justice mobilization. Indigenous peoples in Canada are the most impacted, as you have heard, by the destruction of lands, are overrepresented in poverty, homelessness, incarceration, and various other forms of systemic violence and racism. These institutions of settler dominance reproduce and maintain settler colonialism. Idle No More is using various forms of public gatherings and media to educate the public on the ways in which indigenous self-determination is intertwined with struggles against sexism, racism, homophobia, poverty, and environmental exploitation. As author and solidarity activist Harsha Walia argues, 
Cultivating an ethic of responsibility within the Indigenous Solidarity Movement begins with non-natives understanding ourselves as beneficiaries of the illegal settlement of Indigenous peoples' lands and unjust appropriation of Indigenous peoples' resources and jurisdiction. Settler Canadians must take responsibility for actively dismantling entrenched systems of oppression. The only way for us to escape complicity with settlement is active, day-to-day -day opposition to it. Creating and cultivating spaces where we can begin to transform our public organizations and our relationships with each other. Decolonization is a process which requires not only a restoring of our shared history, but also a reimagining of relationships with the land and other species. This requires us to unlearn the oppressive ideologies we currently hold that value profit over justice and actively dismantle the exploitive systems which reproduce them. Adel Namor began with a series of teach-ins in Saskatchewan that sought to educate the Canadian public regarding past and current government attacks on Indigenous sovereignty and environmental protections. Transformative education has been central to the spirit of the Idle No More movement. As Philomena Essed states, one cannot undo critical knowledge. There is no way not to recognize racial and other injustices once you have learned how to see them. In spite of the structural and systemic issues we are facing, I'm hopeful regarding the solidarity work that's being done within the Idle No More movement. I'm hopeful because there are many settlers who choose to resist dominance. But in order for these numbers to grow, Canadians need to be given critical knowledge that intervenes in the stories that reproduce the current systems of inequality. As Indigenous author Ben Okri suggests, in a fractured age when cynicism is God, here is a possible heresy. We live by stories and we also live in them. One way or another, we are living the stories planted in us early or along the way, or we are also living the stories we planted, knowingly or unknowingly, in ourselves. We live stories that either give our lives meaning or negate it with meaninglessness. If we change the stories we live by, quite possibly, we change our lives. Please join us in becoming I Don't Know More. <laughs>